In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My dear faithful, this day for the secular world is significant because it's the first day of the year. Uh, thus, this is why we call it, obviously, New Year's Day. But for Catholics, uh, there is no feast for the first day of the secular calendar. Uh, we don't celebrate the first day of the secular calendar as such. Our liturgical year, our New Year, as far as uh, the, the Catholic New Year, it really began a month ago with the first Sunday of Advent. That's when we recommence the uh, sort of penetration, the understanding of the mysteries of the life of our Lord. So we go through the history of the world, starting with the first Sunday of the Advent, ending in the last Sunday after Pentecost. So if we have a first-class feast today, and we do have a first-class feast today, it's really for a different reason. In fact, there's two reasons why we have a first-class feast today. The first reason, as you know, is that eight days after his birth on Christmas Day, our Lord submitted himself to the Jewish ritual of circumcision. And this was the first time that he shed his precious blood for our sakes. It was also the occasion for the conferral of his name. Um, the Jewish parents would name their male child on the eighth day after his birth, on the day of the circumcision. So in other words, the naming of the child was associated with a religious ritual. The, the religious ritual of circumcision was the time when you conferred the name on the child. And you know, we, we have something similar today uh, with the sacrament of baptism. Uh, even though you've already given the child a name when, when the child is born, yet at the baptism is when the priest, uh, sort of, as far as the church is concerned, officially confers the name on the child in the act of baptizing the child. So we know with our Lord that his name was decided long before his birth. The name was revealed by the angel both to Our, our Lady and St. Joseph. Um, so the angel Gabriel spoke to both of them and told both of them to name the child Jesus. And that's why today's gospel says that the child was named Jesus, the name that he was given him before he was conceived in the womb. So this uh, name was already planned before the Annunciation took place and the conception of our Lord. The name Jesus is a Hebrew word meaning Savior. We obviously um, don't name children Jesus in, in, in English. In, in English-speaking countries, we don't give this name to children. But in Spanish-speaking countries, they do give this name to their male children. Um, in both its Hebrew form and its Spanish form. So, um, for instance, I, I've known Mexicans named Jesus, uh, the, 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 the Spanish pronunciation of the name Jesus. I've also known Mexicans named Salvador, Salvador meaning uh, Savior in, in Spanish. So that's two ways in which Spanish-speaking countries uh, give to their male children a, a name like the name of our Lord. This would be the equivalent of naming your son Jesus or Savior in English. If you had a son named Savior, for instance. So I'm not recommending this. Uh, this is not our custom in, in Anglo-Saxon countries to, to name our children this way. However, what, what I'm trying to do is to bring home to you the, the sense, uh, a sense of the impression that this name makes. Uh, that this name, Jesus, or Savior, is really the name of a role before it's the name of a specific person. So God willed to give this name to himself to indicate that his life on this earth is identified with his role as Savior of the world. He came on this earth to be our Savior. Um, this is what we say in the creed, that he came on account of our sins to save us from our sins. But I've mentioned that really there are two reasons for today's feast, and it's actually the second reason for the feast that I would like to emphasize today. 
The first reason, as I mentioned, is to celebrate our Lord's circumcision. And we have a feast tomorrow to, to celebrate his name. We have a, a specific feast for his name. Uh, the feast of the holy name of Jesus is, is tomorrow. But the second reason why we celebrate a first class feast today is because today is the octave day of Christmas. It's the eighth day. Um, after Christmas, the eighth day of Christmas, we could say, you may know that there are three feasts of the year in the 1962 Missal that we use. There's three feasts of the year that have octaves, Christmas, Easter, and Pentecost. Our three feasts, wherein um, the, you have an octave which sort of stretches the feast out in time. It extends the feast from being a one-day feast to being an eight-day feast. And it's almost as if on the very day of the feast, we pause time and we stay stop. And we say, this day is too short. We're going to make it longer. We're going to make it eight times longer. And in this way, the day after Christmas is also Christmas Day. And the day after that is Christmas Day. And the day after that is Christmas Day. Until you come to today, which is the eighth day, and today is also Christmas Day. And when we come today, it's like we, we look at our watch and, and we say, oh, Christmas Day is coming to an end. Let's try to end the day with great solemnity. Let's try to end the day with the same level of solemnity, the same first-class solemnity that we had at the beginning of the day. And so we, as it were, celebrate Christmas Day one last time with the same solemnity as we celebrated it on the 25th of December. Now, in, in Catholic countries of old, all of us would have had a very deep sense of the octave, of the very uh, a very deep sense of this fact that uh, Christmas was still continuing. Um, so the society around us would be sustaining, would be actively sustaining the Christmas joy in all of its intensity throughout that whole eight-day period. They would make sure that everybody knew that it was still Christmas. And this would have the effect of causing us to appreciate the mystery of Christmas at a deeper level than we could if we just celebrated it on one day. And that's really the purpose of the octave. The, con the continuation of the celebration is meant to be a continuation of the mystery. The church knows that it's absolutely impossible for you to grasp the richness of the mystery of Christmas in just one day. Obviously, it's not possible for you to grasp it throughout the, the duration of your entire lifetime. You will never exhaust the mystery of Christmas. So, and of course, there's no possible way you can grasp the richness of Christmas if you just open up presents in the front of the Christmas tree on one day and then the next day you put the Christmas tree out on, on, on your, your front curb and you, you box up the gifts that, that you just received and you send them back. Um, that's certainly no way to grasp the richness of the mystery of Christmas. This is obviously what's happening in, in our secular society. That our, our secular society today is not in any way maintaining the Christmas joy. They're not looking to maintain the Christmas joy they're, they're looking to get on with life after going through this sort of um, secular ritual of exchanging gifts because the feast day is not seen to be a feast at all. It's just seen as being a secular holiday. The only purpose of the holiday is to take a break and exchange some gifts. Isn't this fun? We exchange gifts. Um, this is we, we do this at the end of the year. Um, it, it's very good for, for business, very good for the economy. Uh, we have a good time. Uh, we take a break. We exchange some gifts. But the purpose is not to rejoice in the fact that God assumed flesh as a tiny child in order to save us from our sins. 
And if that is what Christmas is really about, if it's really about God becoming Jesus the Savior, born in Bethlehem, then we're certainly not done with the feast when we've opened our presents. In a sense, as I say, we're never really done with this feast, but certainly not done with it after one day. We need to dwell in the mystery for an extended time so that we can appreciate it more deeply. And this is what the octave is all about. It's the church inviting us to dwell in the mystery of Christmas over the period of a week. It's like the church asking us to contain or trap the Christmas joy and preserve it and um, allow it to, to seep into us over an extended period of time such that we sort of bathe in that joy for the whole of a week. Every single day of, of the octave up to today, uh, the church has us pray in the post-communion of the Mass, at least the, the Masses that didn't have a second-class feast like St. Stephen or the Holy Innocents. The, the, the prayer of the post-communion says, Grant, Almighty God, that the Savior of the world who was born today bestow immortality on us just as He bestowed on us our divine adoption. So, in other words, every single day of those eight days, the church is speaking of our Lord as being born today. Not yesterday or the day before. Every single one of those days for the church is Christmas Day. So, she's telling us to stay in that Christmas spirit. She's telling us to live Christmas from day to day over a period of eight days, as otherwise it will not have the significance that it should have for you. And really, uh, uh, what I'm trying to emphasize is that in these days of secularism, it's all the more important for you to be aware of the spirit of the church. To the degree that you're able to live in that spirit of the church, that spirit that has sanctified all of your ancestors, all of our ancestors, and maintain the Catholic faith in them and enable them to pass that Catholic faith from generation to generation to the degree that you're able to incorporate that spirit into your life you will also be able to maintain the faith in yourself and transmit it to your children and transmit it to your children's children but if you don't have the sense uh, the spirit of the church if you don't have the, the, the Catholic spirit if you're not able to assimilate that Catholic spirit to a sufficient intensity, then you won't be able to keep it in yourself. You won't be able to transmit it to your children. So it's really important that we keep Christmas going after Christmas Day. And Christmas, keeping Christmas going really essentially means keeping the Christmas joy going. It's about tasting the joy of the presence of our Lord among us. The church wants us to understand what it means to have a Savior. She wants us to rejoice in the fact that we have a Savior. And as I told you yesterday, this is the joyful part of the joyful mysteries. The fact that we have a Savior who has assumed our human nature and dwells among us. We rejoice in the fact of the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we've got to maintain the Christmas joy. We've got to keep singing Christmas carols, those Christmas carols, the innumerable Christmas carols that are so full of joy and find so many different ways in human words to express the joy of human beings at the presence of their Savior. So many stanzas of so many songs that embody that, that celebration, that spirit of celebration of the significance of having our Lord among us. We take time off work. We spend more time with our families in pleasant activities. We perform more spiritual activities, such as attending Mass or reading uh, about the mystery of Christmas and our spiritual reading. In short, we prolong the Christmas cheer. We prolong that authentic spirit of Christmas um, that we see embodied in those past ages. And we defeat the Grinchy Christmas of the world which wants to leave Christ out of Christmas and so take away the real source of our Christmas joy. 
That's why people don't really taste that Christmas joy because there's no connection between Christmas and Christ anymore. Whereas we, we try to keep Christ in our presence and we try to continue to rejoice in the presence of Christ among us. And you may wonder why I'm saying this to you after the eight days are up. You, you're probably saying, well, you should have been here on Christmas and told me that, and then the next eight days I would have made sure to have a good time. But now it's too late. Um, well, in fact, it's not too late. Uh, we are at the octave day of Christmas, but you're, you probably should know as well that this is not, in the mind of the church, the end of our celebration of Christmas. Even after the octave day, the church wants us to continue to celebrate Christmas, not with the same intensity. The most intense celebration is during those eight days. But even afterwards, we're meant to continue that Christmas joy at a lower level, but we're meant to continue it. You probably know there's something called the 12th day of Christmas. And even there's something we may refer to as the 40th day of Christmas. For 40 days, we're meant to continue that Christmas joy all the way up to the Feast of the Presentation of Our Lord on the 2nd of February. The church wants you to taste the joy of all the joyful mysteries during the Christmas season, all the way up to the Feast of the Presentation, the fourth joyful mystery, and the fifth joyful mystery is commemorated, in fact, before that. So, my dear faithful, if we rejoice today, if we as Catholics rejoice today, it's not really because it's the first day of the calendar year, and we made it to another year, and so on and so forth. We really rejoice today because our Lord shed his first blood for us and was given the name Savior, and also because this is the end of Christmas Day. This is the conclusion of Christmas Day in the mind of the church, and we want to give a special solemnity to this day. So on this day and the days that follow, please keep that Christmas joy in your hearts. Please learn to experience the joy of the mystery of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ amongst us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.